to see everybody. Uh, my name is Angelo Ricarte. I'm a fifth year graduate student here at Yale University. And I'm a theorist. I spend my days trying to figure out how we make supermassive black holes. So black holes are nature's most extreme objects. These are things that are so compact that not even light can escape from their gravity. But the black holes at the center of the galaxies uh, that are the most massive in the universe also contain so much material that the amount of mass that's put in them is often enough to make entire new galaxies. And the reason I got into this is because, well, I just love sci-fi. So black holes have kind of infused the public consciousness. People like me are really in love with the idea that there are objects from which light can't escape, uh, and objects that are physically bending space and time. And people are so aware of them now that some uh, science fiction writers do their best to try and make the most accurate black holes possible, like in the image on the top right from Interstellar. Actually, brand new scientifically accurate simulations were run in order to make their black holes as accurate as possible. Other works do less of a great job getting a more rudimentary understanding, like uh, that of Colonel O'Neill in Stargate SG-1. I still do not understand this black hole. Well, a black hole is this really big thing. It's, uh, <laughs> but basically, it's a massive hole. <laughs> Maybe I guess they kind of got the spirit of it. Eh, not really. All right, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to elevate you to a greater understanding of black holes, in particular supermassive black holes, and that of poor Jack O'Neill. But to understand black holes, we're first going to need to talk about gravity. So gravity is the force that's pulling everything with mass together, and one measure of an object's gravity is its escape velocity. That's how fast you need to be able, you need to move in order to escape that object's gravity. Everything in the universe has a gravitational pull, like between me and you, even, but you don't notice it because the gravitational force between you and the Earth is so much stronger. And so here are three different spherical, massive objects, each with their own escape velocities. So starting off with this basketball here, in order to escape the gravitational field of a basketball, you need to be moving at at least 0. .00004 miles per hour. And so in order to escape, you need to walk away. <laughs> okay, it's, it's not relevant. Uh, if you're stuck at the park, it's not because you're gravitationally attracted to a basketball, that excuse is not going to work on your parents. But for something like the Earth, which has so much more mass, the gravitational field is a lot stronger. To get away from the Earth, you need to be moving at at least 25,000 miles per hour. And not everybody has the capabilities to do that. You need to ask people with the right equipment and with a lot of money. <laughs> Eventually, if you pack enough mass into a small enough space, you end up with something that has an escape velocity equal to the speed of light. And if you try and get away from something like that, well, then you start running into problems. One of the fundamental principles in Einstein's theory of relativity is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's a universal speed limit. And so that means that anything that makes it into a black hole is trapped inside of that black hole forever. It becomes part of the black hole. So you somehow need to crush something with mass to a small enough volume. How small do you need to make something? Let's start with something like the Earth. Actually, you need to make it very small indeed. You need to crush the mass of the Earth all the way down to the size of small towns. So here, we're now looking at the Earth, the, uh, sorry, the mass of the Sun is crushed down to the size of about Manhattan. So anything can, in principle, become a black hole if you make it into a small enough volume. For the Earth, it need to be about this big, as big as this dollar coin here. Uh, but for me, those are really puny black holes. I'm interested in the supermassive ones. This is the central black hole of the Phoenix Cluster compared to the solar system. Let's take a look at all of the suns that are packed inside of this black hole. I think that's a lot of stars. 
Actually, we're not even close. There's so many more stars packing inside this thing. Okay. Not how we people increase the scale. Surely we're almost there. Good lord. Okay, so this thing has 20 billion suns worth of mass crammed behind the event horizon of the point of no return of this black hole. And to show you what that amount of mass usually looks like in our universe, here's the large Magellanic cloud. It's a galaxy. Uh, that amount of matter is enough to make something that looks like this, full of stars and planets, maybe even life. But for some reason, the universe decided to cram all of that into a black hole in that previous case. All right, so so far I've told you all about black holes, but I haven't proven to you that they exist. And how can you possibly know about them if I said uh, you can't even see them, light can't escape? Well, the best evidence for black holes comes from the center of our own galaxy. And astronomers like Andrea Ghez at UCLA have been pointing telescopes for decades, tracking the motions of stars. Each of these colored points represents a star that was observed by the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea. And here, starting from 1995, she's been busy pointing year after year at the same spot at the center of the galaxy. And when you put together all of these years of data, you realize that all these stars appear to be orbiting around some mysterious invisible object in the very center. You can analyze the orbits, and it turns out that whatever has got these stars in its grip has a mass of four million times the mass of the sun, confined to uh, a tiny space in there that's less than at least a few hundred times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Now, for this black hole at the center of our galaxy, you need to know exactly where to look because this thing is dormant and invisible. Other galaxies have black holes that make themselves a lot more obvious. This is the Centaurus A galaxy, and at the very center there's something shining really brightly and even emitting these enormous jets that are stretching out uh, across the entire length of the galaxy. And that's because this has what's called an active galactic nucleus, or an AGN. There's a black hole at the center towards which there's a lot of gas that's falling. And when matter falls in a gravitational field, like this tennis ball here, it gains energy, it gains kinetic energy. And we've got a lot of kinetic energy from things coming in uh, in a disordered fashion from all sorts of directions, that generates heat. And a lot of heat from a really strong gravitational field, like that of a supermassive black hole, causes whatever's falling in to shine. So you can see the light of the material before it gets into the black hole, uh, affected by the gravity of the supermassive black hole. And we think that shining black holes like these are important for understanding how galaxies form. So how do you make a monster like these supermassive black holes? Well, we think at the very, in the very early universe, we started off with black holes that were less massive. Let's call them baby black holes, or seed black holes. Uh, in the very early universe, uh, there are different ways that we think that the first black holes formed. We're still unsure about the details, but there are a few different theories. Our telescopes can get quite pro the really small masses and uh, really early times that, that uh, are needed in order to fully understand this problem. But one way that we know that is a surefire way to make black holes is by taking the first stars and blowing them up in supernovae. We know that happens even today. The most massive stars in the universe uh, will blow up when they end their lives, and the cores uh, can no longer support the gravity of, uh, of their own mass, so they collapse into, into black holes. And that'll make a black hole that's on the lower end of this mass range. But we need to get to something that's millions or billions of times the mass of the sun, so it could be helpful to start off with something a lot more massive. Maybe something like 100,000 times the mass of the sun. So one way you might do that is by a process called direct collapse. And perhaps the very first enormous gas clouds in the universe collapse under their own weight to make black holes directly, skipping the uh, star stage entirely. And it's possible that by, uh, that with the right conditions, you can end up uh, directly collapsing a black hole that's about 100,000 times the mass of the sun. There are many other processes, uh, but one that's kind of in the middle is a collisional runaway inside of a star cluster. 
So maybe you start off with a whole bunch of different stars, but they all collided together somehow to make a big star that then blows up and leaves a black hole in the middle of this fast range. So now that we have something that's a baby black hole, or a black hole seed, as we call it in the field, we still need to grow it by an enormous factor, by at least a factor of 10,000, to get to a billion solar masses. So how do we do that? Well, if you look at smaller black holes, stellar mass black holes, there are a few of them in the galaxy that we know of that are siphoning gas away from companion stars that they're orbiting around. The gravity of the black hole on the left is pulling the outer envelope of the star on the right into something that we call an accretion disk. And basically it's spiraling into the black hole the way that water drains down your, down your sink, uh, making it into the, uh, past the event horizon at the very center. So if this is what happens on stellar mass scales, then supermassive black holes probably do something on galactic scales. And indeed, that is what we see. Supermassive black holes devour the gas from their host galaxies. Here's an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of uh, a galaxy on the left. And if you look in the radio, you can see jets like you saw in the previous picture, and also from uh, Centaurus A before. And also an accretion disk of stuff that's slowly swirling into a supermassive black hole. So in the field, we call this uh, the feeding problem, figuring out how to get gas to a supermassive black hole. And the fact that this is a problem may surprise some of you. It's a common misconception that black holes just suck in everything, and that eventually everything will be inside of a black hole. Uh, but actually, matter is happy just orbiting around and around a black hole forever, like those stars that I saw that I showed you near the beginning. In order to get something into a black hole, you need to disturb the orbits somehow. And we're still figuring out exactly the processes by which the universe typically does that. But one surefire way to do that is to take two perfectly happy disks of galaxies and collide them together. And we think that's, that this happens in the universe uh, pretty often, uh, a lot more often in the early universe. But in about four billion years, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy in a similar fashion, although that's the subject of an entire other talk. And when that happens, the nice disks of gas that you start off with get disturbed. The gas collides with itself, and a lot of it makes it to the very center of the galaxy, where there exists supermassive black holes ready to eat this new gas supply. Eventually, the two galaxies merge into one more disorganized elliptical galaxy, and the system relaxes eventually. And we started off with black holes at the centers of each of these galaxies, so we think that the black holes themselves will also eventually merge. This is another way to grow supermassive black holes, just feed them more black holes. Um, so this is a natural process after a galaxy merger, although we're still working out the details on exactly how long it takes between a galaxy merger and a black hole merger, because you've got to get uh, past a very large range of physical scales. When that happens, uh, the space-time is so warped that the black holes, while they're merging, emit gravitational waves. And actually, a couple years ago, the very first gravitational waves were detected by LIGO. Um, so that's space-time itself bending and warping just a little bit by these uh, massive bodies orbiting around and then merging together. Now, th that was observed for stellar mass black holes. We think that in the future, uh, new observatories, especially one called LISA that will be launched in space, are going to be able to observe the same thing on supermassive scales. So this is where I'll stop. And some takeaways are that every massive galaxy has a supermassive black hole. And even though they're invisible, we know that they're there because we could study the visible things that are orbiting around them being affected by their gravity. In order to make one of these things, we think you need to start with a black hole seed very early in the universe, and then grow it primarily by feeding it gas from the galaxy. But there are a lot of details of this process that are still being worked on today, both by cutting-edge simulations and the latest telescopes. So I hope that some of you uh, get inspired to join me in the pursuit of figuring out how these supermassive black holes form and what they do to their host galaxies. And even if you don't, you can expect to hear many new discoveries in the near future about this field.
Thank you. Okay, any questions for Angelo? I know some of you, we got a lot of questions for this one, so just know that if your question does not get heard, all the speakers will be around after the talks, and you can just come up and talk with them. If you haven't gotten your stickers yet, that would be a great opportunity to get your last few stickers is by asking questions of our presenters. How do you measure the mass or how many suns would be inside of a black hole? That's a great question. Let's turn off. Seems odd. Well, all right. Well, at least the last is exactly as long as the All right. So, uh, like with the <laughs> like with the stars before. All right. Well, like like with the stars that I showed orbiting around the uh, black hole at the center of the galaxy, you need to measure the velocity is how fast things are moving inside of the gravitational field. Uh, now, you, for black holes that are farther away than the one at the center of the galaxy, you, it's a, more of a bulk measurement of a whole bunch of different stars. Uh, but the idea is that uh, if you have a stronger gravitational field, things are going to move a lot faster. Uh, whereas if you have a weaker gravitational field, things will move slower until, uh, if there's nothing at all, uh, gra no gravity will cause something to just basically stay at rest. And you can, so if you know how fast things are moving and how far away they are from the thing that's gravitating, you can maybe guess at how fast the thing is. If two universes collide, how big of a black hole would that make? Uh, so first of, first of all, those were two galaxies, not universes. Yes, yeah. but like, universes are bigger types of galaxies, so if two universes themselves collided, would it make a super, super massive black hole? Uh, okay, so the universe contains everything that we could possibly observe, and as far as we know, there's nothing else for, the, for, the uni for our universe to collide with in some extra dimensional space, so I can't really answer your question. I can tell you about more I can tell you more about galaxy collisions that would be fun. Okay, then never mind. Alright. <laughs> what exactly is a dormant black hole? So when I say a dormant black hole, I mean a black hole that isn't uh, actively accreting matter at uh, an appreciable rate, which usually just means an observable rate. Uh, so when you throw matter into a black hole, like I was sharing with the Centaurus A galaxy, a lot of that matter heats up, and so that matter shines and you can observe it. Uh, and that also release a lot of energy into the galaxy. Uh, a dormant black hole is one where, for whatever reason, there isn't a lot of, gal there isn't a lot of gas around, and it's not, it's not gaining a lot of matter or, and shining appreciably. Yeah, so uh, at the center of our own galaxy, that black hole is basically creating nothing. Can a black hole stop existing? So there's a process uh, called Hawking radiation, by which a black hole very slowly radiates away its mass. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, that process is so slow that it's uh, totally negligible compared to the lifetimes of stars and galaxies and all of the things that we care about. Probably one more question. So, um, what you mentioned LIGO and how they picked up vibrations through the universe. Uh, did you? Did you know that um, it also picked up two new, I think, a neutron stars? That, yeah, that's right. And they also discovered like gold. And they had the neutron stars. They had like gold dust, basically, around there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, the question was about uh, the neutron star merger that happened in August. 
That's a very exciting event uh, because it's the first time that uh, in astronomy we observe something simultaneously with uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is light, and also gravitational waves. And uh, it also solved a problem about the formation of heavy elements like gold. Uh, so now we know that um, the collisions of neutron stars